Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Institute for Government event on how Parliament should scrutinise the relationship between the UK and the EU now that we've left the EU. My name's Hannah White, and I'm Deputy Director of the Institute for Government, and I lead our work on Parliament. So the UK may have left the EU, but it will continue to have a relationship with the EU, of course, and that will be shaped by the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, which was struck by Boris Johnson's government in December, and the subsequent agreements which will be reached in the coming months and years. That means that Parliament will continue to have a role, of course, in also in scrutinising developments emerging from the EU and the way the government, the UK government, handles the relationship between the UK and the EU. What remains under discussion is exactly how Parliament should approach that task. And I'm delighted to say that we've got a fantastic panel with us today to discuss this question including some parliamentarians who have played a key role in scrutiny of the EU in recent years. So the people we have joining us today are uh, in alphabetical order. Um, Hilary Benn, MP, who's uh, the former chair, of course, of the, first the exiting the EU committee uh, and then latterly the future relationship with the EU committee during the period of the transition. Welcome, Hilary. Morning. We have uh, Bridget Fowler, who is a senior researcher at the Hansard Society. Thanks for joining us, Bridget. Morning. Uh, we have David Jones MP, who is a member of the European Committee and of the, the Political and Constitutional uh, Reform Com um, Affairs Committee. I have to get this right. Um, and of course, the former uh, minister in the Department for Exiting the EU and a former Secretary of State for Wales. Morning, David. And we have uh, Lord Kinnell, who is chair of the House of Lords EU committee. So I'm sure you'll all agree a fantastic panel uh, to discuss these really timely and important issues. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping points. To remind you, this event is live and it's on the record. And we will put video and sound of the event up on our website as soon as possible after the event. So you can come back to it and watch it again if you wish to do so. Uh, Please do tweet if you wish to do so, and the IFG uh, team will be will be tweeting live as we go on. Um, the way I'm planning to run the event will just be as a conversation between the uh, between the panelists and myself. Um, please do uh, suggest questions. Um, I'll, I'll kick off with a few of my own, but you can begin as soon as you like putting questions in the chat uh, on YouTube. Um, in order, just a heads up, in order to put to submit questions via the YouTube chat, you will have to be logged into YouTube to do that. But as I say, please start doing that uh, as soon as you like, and I'll start to bring in those questions into the discussion. Um, I think it's possible that uh, uh, David is having some trouble with his sound, so um, I, I, we're just trying to resolve that, but we will um, carry on and come to him only when he can hear the questions which we are putting to him. Okay, so... I want to start by looking back a little way. Um, Parliament considered the, the EU future relationship bill only four days after the Trade and Corporation Agreement was published and less than 48 hours before the TCA came into effect. And it spent around 15 hours debating that bill as opposed to 272 hours for the EU withdrawal bill. You can also rely on the IFG to, to count the, the, the hours of parliamentary time spent on different things. Um, Hillary, do you think that the, the House of Commons had um, sufficient opportunity to scrutinise that bill? Um, well, clearly not. But then given that the deal was only done on Christmas Eve and we had the 31st of December deadline, that was never going to be possible. And as we've already seen since the start of the new year, there are all sorts of implications of the change in our the status of our relationship left the single market that various industries are discovering it's a very complex agreement it's very long there are lots of footnotes and exceptions and special arrangements and so on and i think in fairness all of us are still trying to get our heads fully round what it contains what however is is very clear is there is a continuing need for parliamentary scrutiny and that's why uh, this week the committee on the future relationship with the european union issued a report i suppose i'd put it from beyond the grave because we no longer exist in which we said there is a need for future scrutiny 
Uh, Parliament needs to think about that. The government needs to think about it because the impact of our new relationship, the implementation of the TCA and, of course, of the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol is going to have a huge impact on our national life and businesses for a long time to come. And the deal envisages quite specifically that there will be future negotiations that will be incorporated within the framework that the TCA has set up. Thanks, Hilary. And just just thinking about the bill itself, um, do you, what, what do you think it tells us specifically that the Parliament needs to think about in relation to the scrutiny of future international agreements? Well, we don't do it very well, in truth, and other parliaments around the world, Congress, European Parliament and so on, probably wonder why we don't do it terribly effectively. Now, look, I, I understand that when you conclude an international agreement, it's it's a bit difficult when you've got to the final stage and you've uh, initialed it to go back and say, I've taken it to the members and they're not terribly happy about this, that and the other. And that's why the scrutiny of negotiations as they take place is really important in informing the position that the respective parties uh, take. And I do think we need to reflect upon this precisely because this agreement and other trade agreements that the government is negotiating, uh, but this one in particular, because of its scope, its size, the extent to which um, we have built a close relationship with our European friends and neighbours, I do think we need to reflect on how we can do it much better in future. Bridget, can I come to you? Um, what what did you make of the of the scrutiny of, of the TCA itself, and, and what lessons do you think there are for Parliament about about what maybe could change going forwards? Thanks, Hannah. I think um, one of the main lessons that I would take from it is that um, it showed the problems that can arise from the fact that um, scrutiny of new treaties in the UK has tended to rely very heavily. On, on the passage or making of the domestic implementing legislation that may be needed. And the problem with that is that, um, well, there are several problems with it. One is that by definition, it comes at the end of the process after the agreement has been struck. Um, secondly, it's actually about um, scrutiny of legislation rather than scrutiny of the treaty proper. Um, and because it's, scrutiny of legislation. Thirdly, it, it, it is subject to, in the Commons in particular, to the government's control of, of the way in which um, the Commons legislates and, and the time that Commons has to scrutinise legislation. And, and that was demonstrated to a, a pretty extreme degree on the 30th of December. Thanks. Lord no, Charles, can I come to you? Um, what what do you see as, as the future role of the House of Lords in scrutinising um, uh, international agreements? Well, the, um, the the problem with CRAG is two things. Firstly, it was it was designed uh, as something when there was a scrutiny process at the European Parliament level that we could feed into. And secondly, um, the CRAG process is entirely focused on a snapshot right at the end of the process of, of creating an international agreement. Really, uh, a parliament needs to get into the process at the start and follow it all the way along so that it can feed in uh, to the process and, and go along with it. And for, for that reason, the House of Lords has set up an international agreements committee. It's, it would initially was part of the European Union Committee family because there were so many rollover agreements and it's already we've already produced 20 reports on the new international agreements and have come across several just plain errors in the scrutiny process which have then been rectified and um, so already that process has had some beneficial effect. The new International Agreements Committee has been agreed and will be set up at the end of this month and, um, and it is in the process Process of formulating a methodology of working with the government so that in fact there is uh, visibility of the whole process of making international agreements from start to finish and I, I actually the government has been 
pretty helpful so far, although um, things are not written down yet, but the right sort of noises are coming out. And I think that there will there will be an improvement in the scrutiny process, which will be an improvement without resorting to having to make new statute law. And um, I think that's a, a pragmatic advance on the part of the House of Lords. That's really good to hear. Thank you. Um, I should just say that, um, unfortunately, David is having problems with his sound, so I think he's possibly restarting his, his device and hopefully that will rectify matters. I can hear you now, Hannah. That's fantastic. Um, Sadly, so however, just to, to bring you up... nothing of a discussion at all so far, I'm afraid. I was going to say, so to bring you up to speed, we've been discussing so far the scrutiny of international agreements. We started by talking about the scrutiny which Parliament was able to conduct of the of the uh, legislation to implement the TCA before Christmas. Um, and we're, we're just reflecting um, on, on what Parliament needs to do in the future to make sure that its scrutiny of international agreements is effective. And Lord Kinnell was telling us as, uh, about some of the developments in the House of Lords uh, where committees are working with that with with the government to think about how that scrutiny can happen do you have any any thoughts from the point of view of the european scrutiny committee or indeed the house of uh, commons more generally in relation to this specific point of scrutiny of, of international agreements and how we can make sure that parliament has a say well, well certainly in in uh, relation to uh, the uh, withdrawal agreement and the trading cooperation agreement there's a clear need uh, for, I would suggest, a, a dedicated scrutiny mechanism. I know that it has been suggested that this is a matter that could be uh, left to a, a, a melange of, of committees. Um, but sadly, my experience uh, of uh, departmental committees is that they tend to focus far more on domestic issues uh, than on EU issues. I, I'm also a member of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. And you'd have thought that given its title, that committee would be taking a huge interest uh, in European matters. Uh, my view is that given the provisions uh, of uh, both the WA and the uh, TCA, uh, it is essential that there should be a, a dedicated uh, committee to, to scrutinize the arrangements that are set, set up under those particular agreements. And, um... Do you do you think that that, that that sort of that committee exists already in the form of the European Scrutiny Committee? Do you think the the European Scrutiny Committee can take that role on? Would it need a change of remit, or are you thinking about an entirely new committee? Well, I, I think that the European Scrutiny Committee is the obvious committee, given uh, its experience, uh, given the support that it's got. Uh, clearly, its remit would have to be changed. The standing orders would have to be changed because. Uh, the standing orders that relate to the uh, scrutiny committee, of course, uh, are, are those that were developed at a time that we were uh, still part uh, of the European Union. I mean, there are references to scrutiny reserves and so on that are not really appropriate given uh, what's happened. But I think that the uh, European Scrutiny Committee would be a good foundation for a dedicated committee to scrutinise the various issues that are bound to arise uh, under the two uh, agreements with the European Union. Hilary, can I come back to you? Because your uh, committee, as you said, published a report almost from beyond the grave this, 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 this week, talking specifically about this, this question. And how do you think that the existing um, committees and scrutiny mechanisms in the House of Commons might need to be adapted to make sure that there's sufficient scrutiny of all the issues uh, that will need to be looked at now that the UK has left the EU? Well, in the report itself, we um, recommended that the Liaison Committee look at this and we said the government should come forward with proposals. But uh, I have to say that I think David is right. Uh, our committee no longer exists. There is the European Scrutiny Committee. I think there's a very strong argument for having, and I'm speaking personally now, not on behalf of the former uh, committee that I chaired, I think there's a very strong argument for having a committee that is dedicated to this task um, and the obvious choice would be to look to the European Scrutiny Committee, change its terms of reference in the way that David has suggested and get on with the work. And can I turn to you, Bridget, and, and ask you quickly to summarise for us what you think the main areas of that work are now? Because there's quite a few, aren't there? 
There, there are quite a few, and um, the the scope of that work is one of the issues that will need to be discussed and decided upon, and I think probably developed as we go along. I think it will be whatever happens, it will be a learning experience, and and any new process should have you know sunsets or or reviews built in. But um, I mean, there, there's several there's several areas. The the area that has received the most attention is obviously. Um, the operation of the quite elaborate architecture of UK EU bodies that are now set up under both the withdrawal agreement and the TCA. Um, these are this is an, an instance of how does Parliament scrutinise the executive, the government taking action in international bodies. Now, apart from the European scrutiny mechanism. Parliament has had no systematic formal arrangements for doing that. Um, so the fact that it did do it, at least in as much as um, it applied to the to the Council, the, the EU Council and the European Council, that, that is something that could carry over. There is precedent and there is experience um, for that in, in the European scrutiny system. But one sort of side issue that may be worth flagging is the extent to which scrutiny of the UK government's positions in other international bodies also took place through the European Scrutiny Committee because of the EU's role in, in some of those international bodies. So there's there's um, a whole set of issues about scrutiny of, of those various UK EU bodies. Um, another area that I'd, I'd like to flag is, is, the, is the question of UK legislation and regulation which may now affect the future um, relationship with the EU because of the provisions in particular about so-called rebalancing in the TCA. So measures that the, the UK may take may affect um, the future relationship with the EU because, because of the EU's um, right to respond under the TCA. And I do have a concern that as things stand at the moment, there isn't much formal link between the kinds of European scrutiny that we're talking about in forums like this and the normal UK legislative process in particular with relate, um, with reference to delegated legislation. Um, as part of the Brexit process, UK ministers now have vast powers um, to make secondary legislation um, and that process is not formally connected to the sort of European scrutiny. And so one thing we've been thinking about is, is how to how to link those two systems up. Um, so I think those, those are two areas. There's obviously the issue of um, uh, the re future reviews of the TCA that are, that are built into the agreement in 2026. There may be ongoing negotiations with the EU about new agreements and side agreements that will come under the TCA umbrella. So it's, it's really quite a long list of things. And um, the uh, Committee on the Future Relationship with the EU had a list in its report yesterday. European Scrutiny has a list. So I think there's, there's quite a wide degree of agreement about the possibilities, although there's still a debate to be had about the exact scope. And can I just pick up on one thing you said there? Um, and it's a point that, that David Jones mentioned earlier. <clears throat> which is about the capacity of departmental committees um, to, to undertake some of this scrutiny. I know that you, uh, in a former role, worked for the Foreign Affairs Committee in, in the House of Commons. And I just wondered what your observations were about um, the pros and cons of, of, of asking departmental committees to pick up both, as you say, um, the kind of to notice and, 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 and pay attention to the, any legislative changes in their area, which might have um, an effect, as you say, by the rebalancing mechanism um, on the relationship with the EU, or indeed um, secondary legislation, which which relates to their area. How what what needs to be done? Do you think to try to help um, departmental committees play that role, and can it ever be adequate based on our experience of, of how they used to do it? I think the 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 fact that the Westminster Parliament does select committee scrutiny separately from legislative scrutiny is 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 you know a larger issue than simply Brexit um, and there are argue, you know there are strong arguments for doing it this way there are also strong arguments um, for for having a stronger link um, but so so we we were we were I'm not sure that that's something we can address in this forum in terms of more conventional select committee scrutiny 
Um, I mean, one of the things that I've welcomed as a, re as a result of the Brexit process is that more select committees, um, particularly in the House of Commons, have been engaged on EU-related matters. Before 2016, the uh, EU um, issues did tend to be somewhat ghettoised in, in the European Scrutiny Committee. So I would want to see that um, mainstreaming re retained, if possible, while obviously being cognizant of, of the demands on select committee resources. But alongside that, I, I do think that the, the specific um, institutions and processes that are set up under the withdrawal agreement and the TCA are going to need some form of dedicated scrutiny mechanism. So I think there's, there's I think I'd want to see both, I'm afraid. <laughs> Having your cake and eating it. Precisely. Um, Charles, can I come to you? Uh, the, the House of Lords obviously played a, a big role in, in European um, scrutiny and legislative scrutiny uh, while we were members of the EU and has already given some thought and you talked about some of the changes that have already been made um, to, to the, the committee structure in the House of Lords um, to, to recognise the, the, the changes that have happened now. Um, do you think that the, the Lord's sort of committee structure um, is, is now fit for purpose in terms of doing the sort of scrutiny that, that your Lordships will want to do of the EU or are there further changes that might need to be made? No, we've made our changes. We made, we made them last week, in fact, when the uh, we, we've had gone through a six month process of planning for this and uh, which led to a, a report uh, being put to the House and the, and the House debated it and agreed it last week. And so the changes will come into effect from the 1st of April um, and that they're explaining the report and probably it would be too much to go through it in detail now. But in at a high level and in essence, uh, we uh, created a, a Northern Ireland committee to deal with the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. And, um, and that will be a subcommittee of the new European Affairs Committee, which is the successor committee to the European Union Committee. And, um, but otherwise, what we'll be doing is trying to centralize the scrutiny of the, the, the two very large structures. I mean, there, there are effectively eight committees to scrutinize under the withdrawal agreement and a further 24 under the TCA. So it's 32 separate committees that need to be watched and um, I dare say uh, that might be slimmed down a bit in the future. And a lot of the TCA is an agreement to agree. So as has been pointed out, uh, there's going to be a huge amount of uh, additional work that needs to be done. And as we've seen already with the withdrawal agreement, actually the detail is very tricky and takes a long time and can get very emotional. And all of that is of great interest uh, to Parliament, uh, certainly to the Lords uh, for a long time. This is the second reorganization of committees the Lords has had in the last, uh, we had one last year. And I think the Lords will remain um, pretty uh, open to making further small changes as and when things develop um, uh, through the years. And, um, and we will dynamically try and adjust our committee system so that we can deal with the scrutiny properly. That's the structure within the Lords. What is important and has already been mentioned is the structure of scrutiny as between both houses and the government. And um, we have been writing really primarily to Michael Gove and having many conversations and trying very hard to agree a structure along the lines of the very successful structure that was agreed for, uh, for the European Scrutiny um, Committee and for our European Union Committee for the last 40 years. And that's a structure based on documents and explanatory memoranda, evidence sessions, debates, uh, and statements. And uh, But at the moment, uh, we are unable to engage in uh, full uh, discussions on that because, as Michael Gove has said, and I think that's it's quite a reasonable thing to say, actually, it's important that the Commons decides on how it wants to deal with this, and then the Lords and the Commons and the governments will sit down together and actually draw up the, the structure so that you have a scrutiny machine and you know what the fuel is that will go into the machine and um, so we're uh, th that huge piece of work is still to be done uh, but we're we're ready from our side fizzing with ideas and um, very much hoping that the the Commons process for deciding how that they will uh, tackle this um, will will produce someone so that we can we can settle down with the government as the government has has promised in writing. Thank you. That that all sounds very promising. Um, obviously, one of the 
issues for, for how sort of effective parliamentary scrutiny can be is going to be the transparency of what is going on in these these numerous um, sort of committees um, and specialised committees which are being set up, as you say, under the withdrawal agreement in the TCA. Um, Hilary, what are your um, thoughts about about how Parliament can can ensure that it's got the information it needs and timely information to actually have to be able to conduct meaningful scrutiny of what's going on in those bodies? Well, um, the truth is there was, if you take the joint committee under the withdrawal agreement that was discussing the Northern Ireland Protocol, there was no transparency at all because the government wasn't providing any. Every time we asked Michael Gove, so what's going on? Well, these are confidential discussions and I can't tell you. And think of what's coming up. The, the two grace periods for the movement of food and agri-food products that were agreed eventually, uh, three months for export health certificates for goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland, six months for um, uh, meat that is fresh and chilled. Now, what happens if those grace periods are not extended? given the difficulties that we have already seen. So the government, this has to work on a, a two-way basis and the government has got to be open to Parliament, the Commons and the Lords, about what is going on in those bodies. Similarly, the Partnership uh, Council that has been established under the TCA. And that does in part, I mean, it's more than just um, uh, uh, the UK Parliament, it does bring us on to the proposed parliamentary partnership assembly because that is given under the TCA specific responsibilities. It is allowed to request information about the, the implementation, uh, to get informed of recommendations and decisions and to make recommendations itself. So we have to use all of the means that will be at our disposal and the PPA and I hope uh, we're going to get on and establish that as quickly as possible. Um, but it does require the government, whoever is in government, to be willing to share with the House of Commons and the House of Lords what is being discussed, saying I can't tell you when the implications of what is being discussed are so important for our constituents and our communities and our businesses um, isn't really good enough. David, can I come to you on that one? Obviously, as you said, uh, up until now the ESC has had the scrutiny reserve which has given it a certain degree of, of confidence that it's going to have access to, to uh, information about EU legislative proposals and, and so on. Um, are you, what are your thoughts on, on, on how committees and the government can, can come to a sort of mutually satisfactory agreement on, on what should be provided and when? And can I ask you specifically um, in relation to the devolved um, assemblies um, obviously, they will have a, uh, you know, the devolved government and the assembly will have a stake in, in, in much of what's being discussed. Do you think, um, Hillary was talking about the um, the PPA there, do you think that the, the devolved assembly should play any, any role in that? Well, I, I, I agree with Hillary uh, that the uh, arrangements that are set up under both the withdrawal agreement and the uh, TCA are, are particularly uh, opaque. Um, we've seen um, communications coming out of the Joint Committee which are extremely scant and, and, and frankly add very little to parliamentary or public knowledge of what's happening in there. And I think that mm. one of the concerns of those who were pro-Brexit, as indeed I was, uh, was that the decision-making process of the European Union was opaque, it was conducted behind closed doors. And what we are in danger of doing is replacing that state of affairs with a similar state of affairs uh, under the new arrangements. Um, so uh, I think it's extremely important that the United Kingdom Parliament should, if you like, remedy the difficulties that are set up under the arrangements within both of these international agreements and put in place provisions which will enable Parliament uh, to scrutinise, notwithstanding what is provided for uh, in, in the international agreements. Um, so far as the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly is concerned, well, I, I, I think it may prove to be a useful vehicle. At the moment, uh, again, we know little of it. There is not much reference to uh, the, the, the PPA in the, um, in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Uh, we do have to set it up. We have to set up, uh, I would hope, uh, terms of operation that make for transparency. Um, for, for example, uh, Hillary referred to that the, there being maybe a way in through 
the provisions that uh, under which the PPA can require information to be provided. That is actually uh, uh, only a, a power that the Assembly has got. It's got to be in a position to exercise that power. Uh, and the issue of what is relevant information, of course, is another uh, in interesting discussion. Um, so I think that we're at a very early stage in that process. And I think that the United Kingdom Parliament does need to urge the government to put in place systems that will ensure that the PPA does become a, a genuinely useful body. So far as the devolved administrations are concerned, clearly they do have uh, a, a, an interest uh, in certain areas of the discussions that will be taking place both in the Joint Committee uh, and in the Partnership Council and, of course, in the PPA. Uh, and again, I think that domestically we need to set up arrangements which will provide for consultation with the devolved administrations and the devolved uh, assemblies uh, to make sure that, uh, as far as possible, uh, every part of our constitution has a role to play uh, in our, our, our relationship with the European Union. Thank you. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Bridget, can I ask you um, whether there are any lessons that um, the, the, the UK Parliament ought to be uh, learning from other countries and other legislatures which uh, have sort of analogous um, uh, relationships with the EU? Obviously, nobody has quite the same relationship that, that, that has been set up under the TCA, but are there other legislatures who, who have similar um, sort of PPA style agreements, um, uh, arrangements? And, and how do those work and how can they be made to be most effective? In terms of interparliamentary relations, um, having something that uses the terminology of an assembly um, is, is quite unusual. Normally the, the, that word is, is reserved for multilateral bodies, not bilateral ones. Um, so that in itself would be quite unusual. Um, the, and in, in the in the UK, um, the there are three overseas delegations of Parliament, and they are all to th those kinds of multilateral organisations. So there's the delegation to the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, the delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, and the delegation to the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly. Now, clearly, the um, possible um, uh, partnership assembly with the EU wouldn't be of quite that sort. Um, but it would also be different from from the kinds of um, either the kind of multilateral assemblies that the EP also participates in, or with the the purely bilateral arrangements. Um, the EP, as you know, maintains delegations, so-called delegations, for relations with a whole range of countries, and those normally make up the EP um, sort of side of of bodies that are set up under similar bait or sort of similar um bodies uh as as under the tca so they, they they tend to be called things like joint committees um but i think one one thing that is worth pointing out the obvious way in which the tca is different is that um and the withdrawal agreement is different is obviously that part of the the overall set of relation of relations that the UK is now going to have with the EU are different in different parts of the UK. So Northern Ireland is going to have a very different relationship with the EU than than GB. So that's that's something that is is unique. Um, but in general terms, I think these kinds of uh, bodies can be extremely useful in terms of um, information gathering um, and building relationships. But they also are obviously a demand on parliamentarians time and on parliament's resources so i think um both houses should be given the opportunity to to make clear whether or not it want they want to go ahead um with with this um and then i would expect the actual debates over the the sort of mechanics and the money to be possibly quite fraught and difficult um so um but it, it needs it needs to be getting uh, got on with Thanks, Bridget. Charles, the House of Lords has um, sort of historically played an important role in what you might call parliamentary sort of diplomacy. Um, what are your thoughts on, on what will be important in, in making the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly effective? Uh, well, um, 
we call it parliamentary diplomacy and we, yeah, absolutely we do a lot of it. I would say that BIPA is also something yeah. um, which is uh, an example of quite a successful thing and um, yeah. there's, certainly lessons, yes, there's, yeah. there's certainly lessons there. There are 44 different uh, delegations um, that the EU has uh, with international entities, European Parliament that is, and of those, about 15 of them, or exactly 15 of them, are sort of more or less in the model that um, uh, is being described in the TCA. And so I think that uh, the European Parliament will be coming at us with um, a preset um, bunch of things. And these are, uh, the, 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 they have written agreement, uh, they have a, a regularity of formal um, meetings, and they're powered by staff and by budgets. And um, uh, it, it should be remembered that, in fact, both speakers wrote to Michael Gove um, uh, 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 last year to say we would like to have a, uh, a parliamentary assembly in reaction to the EU's draft, early draft of what became the TCA. And Michael Gove wrote back and said, OK, we'll put it in, which is, has, has been now put in. So, in fact, I think both houses have already expressed uh, uh, an enthusiasm for some sort of parliamentary assembly. And um, I think that uh, the European Parliament itself has to go through its uh, ratification process and it won't want to begin discussions of the parliamentary assembly until after that. That's due to end at the end of February, although they have, they are looking, I think, for a few weeks extension on that until their March, um, uh, their March uh, plenary session, which I think is March the 17th, 18th. And um, after that, I think it will be incumbent on the, the Lords uh, to begin to discuss structure uh, and the Commons to begin to discuss, discuss structure with the, um, with, the, with, the, with the Parliament. And I think that one shouldn't be overload the structure at an early stage. One should get the thing going. And a bit like BIPA, it will evolve over time and uh, it, will, it will evolve in a, in a good direction if we treat it seriously and uh, and and use it for what it needs there for which is the, the maintenance and development of the interparliamentary strand of the relationship with such an important neighbor and um, the, all relationships need to have good intergovernmental strands and good interparliamentary strands as well as all the cultural and educational and research strands as well but it's an incredibly important it's something which um the westminster the Parliament has slightly left to our cousins in the European Parliament to deal with uh, in the past. And now we, we're going to have to beef up our function a bit. I don't think we'll get to 44. <laughs> Otherwise, we will have ready no time at all. But we will, uh, I'm afraid, end up doing two or three of these things. And the European Parliament one is very important. Thank you. I'm pleased to say we're getting questions through in the chat. Um, so I'm going to, to, to move to some of of those now and and david I, we've touched a little bit Ooh. now we seem to have lost hannah momentarily yeah at least I don't feel victimized now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very good question in the chat about um, uh, devolved uh, work. And I, I, if we if we had to chair ourselves, I suppose we, we might be able to Tell do me it. My all. connection was unstable. Ah. Can you hear me now, OK? Yeah, yes. we can yeah. hear you, Hannah. You're back. Yeah, sorry. I had an alarming message telling me my connection was unstable, but ho hopefully I'll be stable again. I'm not sure where you lost me. I was I was trying to bring us around to the questions of of, of Northern Ireland specifically, um, and the fact that Northern Ireland uh, under the under the protocol will be having to um, adhere to EU rules, which will have been made without a UK voice at the table. Um, and David, I was just wondering um, what you think Parliament's role should be in 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 trying to. to the, to, to look at and influence that legislation as, as it comes along. Obviously, there won't be a formal role, as I say. And is that something you would see the European Scrutiny Committee taking a role in? Is that going to be for the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee? Um, and what role, again, should should there, could there be for the Northern Ireland Assembly in, in, in any of that? 
I, I think that this is possibly going to be part of the most uh, most of the, the most important part of the work that whatever committee is established will have to carry out because uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, is arguably the most contentious aspect of, of the withdrawal agreement. It's all already been suggested that it amounts to a, a, a contravention of the um, Belfast Agreement. So uh, I think that this is certainly something in which the European Scrutiny Committee or whatever committee succeeds it should be taking a, a great interest. But also uh, in Parliament, uh, I would suggest in many cases jointly with uh, the Northern Ireland uh, Affairs Committee because manifestly the, the, it's uh, an issue in which the expertise of both committees will, will be demanded. And again, of course, the Northern Ireland Assembly will, will have a process too. So I think that this is an interesting aspect of the withdrawal agreement that does require a lot of parliamentary work uh, to put in place uh, pr procedures that will actually uh, enable Parliament both uh, at Westminster and uh, in Belfast to scrutinise what is going to be, I think, a very uh, tricky part of the uh, withdrawal agreement. Thanks, David. And I should say, in case it was lost in my temporary absence, that that was uh, stimulated by a question from, from Sean and McGean, which came through on the chat. And can I uh, encourage anyone else who's watching who wants to ask a question to do so? Um, Hilary, can I can I ask for your thoughts on on the specifics of, of scrutiny of the Northern Ireland Protocol and what's going to be needed to do that effectively? Well, there are I mean there are a number of waypoints in this process. Northern Ireland has one when the Assembly has to decide on whether to continue with the arrangements in the short term, as I've mentioned already. There are uh, questions about what's going to happen to the temporary fixes that were agreed through uh, the Joint Committee and then for the TCA as a whole, there are the review uh, moments that Bridget referred to, in particular in relation to fisheries, because if there isn't agreement after the five and a half years, then potentially some very important parts of the agreement uh, may fall by the wayside, which will put great pressure on those negotiations. I think the point I would add, because I agree with what David said about the need for everyone who has an interest to be involved, but the shortest point about there being no voice at the table in Brussels when it comes to new rules and arrangements does remind us that we as the United Kingdom need to organize ourselves to have a voice in Brussels, even though we are no longer a member of the European Union. Because in this particular case, Northern Ireland, what is decided by the Council of Ministers and the Parliament could have very considerable implications. So an effective British presence, what was UCREP, the, uh, now the, uh, the UK um, uh, Foreign Office team that is seeking to influence. There's also a question about the Parliament office, because when parliamentarians travel, when eventually we can travel again, when the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly is working, we will all need support and briefing and assistance uh, with writing reports. And as everybody knows, other countries that are not in the European Union put a huge amount of effort into lobbying the European Union. Uh, clearly, there'll be an opportunity through the Joint Committee in relation to the protocol, but that will really be dealing with the consequences and decisions that have been taken, not in the Joint Committee, but in uh, Brussels at the Council of Ministers and in the European Parliament, which will have big implications for Northern Ireland. So we, we really need to be organised to apply our influence in all of the places that matter. Has Hannah frozen again? I think we've lost. Ah. Hello. I, I, can you hear me now? Yes, you can. Yes. Yeah. Apologies. We seem to. Hillary, can't, I was doing... can't, can't hear. Sorry, Hannah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. I was just going to ask um, you, David, whether you had any thoughts on the point that Hillary raised about how the UK needs to think more broadly potentially beyond, beyond Parliament, but including Parliament, about influencing in the EU now that we've left? Well, I mean, clearly there will be continuing uh, matters of interest that, that we will have to pursue, 
now that we've left the European Union, uh, 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 Hillary made the point about fisheries. That's going to be one that's relatively immediate because we're going to have to uh, set up new arrangements, probably trilateral one with, ones with Norway, to ensure that uh, we have sufficient control of, of, over our fishing stocks and we can come to a good arrangement with the EU uh, as to fisheries. Um, so I think that there probably will be a, a place for a permanent uh, UK presence uh, in Brussels, it remains to be seen what, what, what the shape of that is going to be. Um, interestingly, of course, the European Union are seeking to establish a, a, an embassy here as well, and um, there are some interesting discussions going on about that at the moment. I've no doubt that all these issues will calm down, but there are going to have to be some uh, working arrangements put in place that ensure that we can get as much access as possible to discuss those issues of continuing mutual concern that will uh, arise after uh, our, our departure has become a thing of the past. Now, the parliamentary geek in me wants to get into some of the detail of, of this body that we've been talking about, um, this, this sort of European Affairs um, Committee, um, which, which I think you know, both David and, um, and Hillary have said that they think would be most effective within the Commons. Um, one of the things you raised, um, uh, I think, David, was about how committees can work together to conduct scrutiny. And I think one of the things that's been really interesting, both in, in the course of uh, Brexit, but also um, most notably in relation to coronavirus, is the way that the Commons committees have used a new guesting procedure to bring in members, expert members from other committees to enhance their own scrutiny. And I was wondering, uh, um, Hillary, whether you thought that maybe could be a fe feature of future European scrutiny that a central committee might be able to draw on expertise from, from other com committees in order to make sure it had the breadth of expertise it would need to, to, to conduct its scrutiny. Well, I hope very much that it will do so, because I've had the, the opportunity on two occasions, Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the Public Accounts Committee, to be invited on as a guest. And I think what it what it does is to bring expertise in a particular area from a departmental select committee. So, for example, if the, the new European Scrutiny, European Affairs Committee was looking at um, work permits for uh, arrangements for musicians, performers, artists, and so on, which is highly current and highly topical. Um, getting somebody from the uh, DCMS Select Committee would make a great deal of sense. Uh, similarly, if it's looking at matters to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol, then somebody from Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. Uh, so we're making the most of all of the knowledge and expertise, as you've said, Hannah, that is available right across the Select committee sector i think it's a it's a really good innovation and i hope it's one that the whichever is the committee that's scrutinizing our relationship with the european union will make liberal use of and can i come to you um bridget in terms of again in the the relationship between the commons and the lords and how that can be joined up and made most effective because obviously we've had these two separate systems in a way but they've you know played similar functions up till now. How will the two, com two, two houses cooperate, do you think? And, and how, how can the staff side make that work as effectively as possible? I mean, I, I think hitherto, both each house has, has essentially operated its own um, scrutiny system and, and taken responsibility for its own scrutiny and has had historically very different committee structures, select committee structures um, to do that. Um, coordination has has tended to happen on an informal basis um, between members and particularly between staff. Um, it is interesting, for example, that the International Trade Committee in the Commons and the new um, International Agreements Committee in the Lords are now scrutinising um, the UK's negotiations for prospective new FTAs. Um, so there's more um, possible duplication between the houses than, than might historically have been the case now. Um, but I think in terms of um, the, the issues that Lord Kinnell was discussing earlier, I think the issue is partly for government, that government will obviously be keen to try and make on, on itself um, as, as light as possible or, or not too onerous. And so it, it won't want to have systems in the two houses that are too different 
each other, um, and particularly when it comes to um, depositing and of, of documents and explanatory memorandums and things, it won't want to be running two different systems for that. So I think that's where the, the issues about coordination um, come in. And um, just to pick up on something that was in the report that, that Hillary's going to be um, published this week and, and sticking with you, uh, Bridget, um, what role do you think the liaison committee can play in all this? Is it, is it going to be for the liaison committee um, to just think about the structures initially and then potentially some centralised committee will sort of try to do the uh, overarching view of scrutiny in the Commons and, and avoid overlap and, 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 and so on between committees? Or um, do you see some some other mechanism? Is it just going to be, you know, in practice left up to committees to do this? And and I wonder whether you can draw on, on the analogy of the role that the um, that the the liaison committee has played in relation to the Brexit process itself. Yeah, um, for me, that the the role that um, yesterday's um, report saw for the liaison committee was one of the the best bits of the report. Um, I I do have a bit of a concern that um, matters could be left to a sort of default um, process whereby the European Scrutiny Committee simply carries on simply by default. Um, and I think it is important that this um, be considered um, by other bodies and by members more widely. And, and I think getting the Liaison Committee involved and also probably the Procedure Committee, um, I think would be, would be welcome on the common side the, the main potential risk of doing that is obviously that it it delays the process and I'm you know very aware of Lord Kinnell's champing bit because the Lord has got itself sorted out and is ready to go um, and so I think I think that's a that's a delicate balance but I do think it needs to be thought of in the round with other um, questions about um, House Commons Select Committee structure um, there was obviously the big liaison committee report. Um, uh, 15 months ago now um, at the end in, in 2019 um, and that hasn't so much been picked up um, until until yesterday's report by um relationship committee so I, I think I think the liaison committee does need to be involved thanks Hillary can I just ask you in relation to whatever new uh, uh, committee comes next or amended committee or, or whatever it turns out to be what are the lessons that you've learned in chairing um, the two committees, uh, you know, over the past few years? What do you think your committee did that was particularly sort of useful or innovative and that you would hope would be taken forward into the, the new system? Oh, heavens, what a question. Um, look, ours was, let's be frank, ours was a very unusual uh, select committee because the tradition in the House of Commons system that you... Uh, are always able or seek to be able to produce reports by consensus I'm afraid didn't apply uh, as anyone who's read the the minutes attached to our reports uh, will have been able to see because Brexit politics influenced the approach that different members of the committee took and I, but I think there's an opportunity now Brexit is done it's over we're out the question becomes right, we are where we are we have the TCA what is the future relationship going to look like? And I do think that where we will see in, in politics and in public and business life, because of the examples that have arisen, people will be saying, can't we now reach an agreement with the EU that makes it a bit easier for us to do this, that, and the other? And the agreement envisages that there could be future negotiations. Secondly, we went, uh, we deliberately went round the country to take evidence. The first place we went to was was uh, Aberdeen at Michael Goh's suggestion when he was a member of the committee to talk to the, the fishing industry there who would, if we if we went back at this point, would have quite a few things to say about how things are, uh, are working. And I, I think the, is it an influence? There was a big argument about whether no deal was a good idea or not. And uh, the view of the committee was no deal would be a very bad idea. This convulsed parliament during the period when there was no majority. And I would uh, just make a point that the announcement by Nissan this morning, securing the future of the plant in Washington, which I very much welcome, is a product of there having been an agreement with no tariffs. And I fear it wouldn't have happened if there had been no deal. Now, I don't mean to bring an unnecessary point of controversy into our uh, constitutional deliberations this morning, but I think it was important that the committee uh, told it as it saw it, 
recognising that others in Parliament and uh, uh, didn't agree with the majority view that was uh, with, that was reached. But I think we can move on from that now. Thanks, Hilary. Um, Charles, did you want to come in on some of the? Yes, I, I, I've, I've been silent at some of the very interesting discussions. And um, so I, I wanted, first of all, to talk a little bit about Northern Ireland's scrutiny and uh, say that I, I very much uh, appreciate the government has now changed its mind. It will continue to deposit uh, documents and EMs. Uh, and those are coming, of course, towards us and towards the European Scrutiny Committee. But um, <coughs> in the new arrangement, those documents will also need to go to uh, to the Northern Ireland Assembly because some of the matters are, are devolved and they need, need also to scrutinise new legislative proposals coming in that will affect them. So when we get uh, the ability to be able to discuss with the government the new structure of how scrutiny should work, and I remain an optimist that we will be able to get there, and I, I, I agree very much with what other colleagues on the call have said, uh, it, we will need to structure in something for the Northern Ireland Assembly as well. And I did think that was an important point. The second point was on the question of joint working between the Lords and the Commons on issues. And I can say that uh, there's, there's quite good communication uh, between members, but it needs to be better. One, two is that I think there's better communication between officials. But the, the two sets of committees in the two houses are set up on a completely different way. The, the, the Commons committees tend to be facing uh, dep departments of government, departmental. The Lords committees are cross-cutting and thematic ones. And so it's very difficult to, to, to have a, a formal joint working. And in fact, I think it produces quite a good complementary set of ways of, of looking at uh, the scrutiny of things. And I always enjoy reading the Commons report, so I very much enjoyed reading Hillary's Beyond the Grave report. And I hope that they feel they learn something from our reports. And thirdly, I just wanted to mention as well on the, on the devolution and folding the devolved in. Uh, there has been some uh, movement there as well. There was a, a letter to Colin McGrath, who's the chair of the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee for the Executive Office, where uh, of the 6th of January, actually, so very recently, where um, Michael Gove said that the, the intergovernmental review will be coming, and he said that the Dunlop report will be published. And I expect those those things, in fact, to, uh, to, 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 to give a lot of help and direction to how the devolved parts of the UK will be folded into the new process of dealing with our relationship with the European Union. Thank you, Charles. And that is uh, actually a, a, an issue and a question that we've been giving a lot of thought to at the Institute for Government. So uh, very good to hear you to hear you discuss those issues. We've just got a couple of minutes now before the end of the, uh, of the event, which I'm, I'm sure you'll all agree has been really fascinating and a, and a, and a great insight from all our panellists. I just want to give them all one last 30 second chance to tell us what they think the priorities should be for Parliament now moving forward. We've already had a, 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 a Lord Knoll's uh, injunction to be to, to get on with things. Um, but um, wh what do you think, you know, the most important next steps are and the most important things to get right this year um, for Parliament? And can I start with you, Bridget? Thanks, Hannah. I, th I think the immediate priority is in the Commons rather than the Lords. And I think it's to at least get some clarity about the process and the timeline going forward for how how these decisions <coughs> excuse me how these decisions are going to be taken in a way that allows members to express their views um, and and decisions to be <coughs> made on a, on a good basis thank you Bridget uh, David can I give you the opportunity to, to t tell us your parting thoughts yes I think it's been a very useful discussion um, and one of the points that Hillary made I thought was absolutely spot on and that is now that the whole process of Brexit is over, we can actually start returning, if you like, to business as usual. But it should be different business as usual. And I think one of the things that we do need to do uh, is to review the uh, select, uh, select committee system. Uh, as I think has been a theme of this discussion, the select committees are actually operating largely in silos at the moment. I think that there's more opportunity now, certainly in the Commons, to have cross-cutting uh, committees uh, combination committees, committees with experts, uh, and this will be particularly important, I think, in the discussions over Europe and also the wider uh, new relations we will be having with the rest of the world. And that's a really interesting point, I think, David, because obviously, um, 
you say, you know, we, business as usual in terms of the sort of maybe, maybe the, the politics around these things, but we don't necessarily just want to go back to the committee structure, which by default we will have uh, in the Commons uh, if if nothing changes. And really interesting question about how the government is going to facilitate a, a discussion and, and 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 allow members to 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 inform that discussion about what should happen going forward. Hilary, can I come to you next? I think the, th the three priorities are, are one, get the new House of Commons scrutiny arrangements for our relationship with Europe up and running as quickly as possible. Um, and, and Parliament should be in the lead because we keep saying, you know, we know the government has to bring forward a motion onto the order paper, but it is for Parliament uh, to determine how it wants to scrutinise what the government is doing. Secondly, to make sure that those scrutiny arrangements uh, work really well in the way that David was describing with departmental select committees and the devolved administrations. And thirdly, get the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly uh, up and running so we can talk to our colleagues in the European Parliament. And there's lots of work to do and we need to get on with it. Thanks, Hilary. And a final word to you, Charles. Um, thank you, Hanno. I mean, I, I can't add very much, but uh, my own priorities, uh, I, I think, because I think that we're, we've set off on the journey uh, that I've described in terms of the scrutiny process and actually having a good process in place, and we've set off on the journey of the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly. But the, the, the thing that is not really out of the starting gate yet are the arrangements uh, within the United Kingdom itself uh, for, for this and the Intergovernmental Review and the Dunlop Report. And I, I hope that uh, this will be the year when we do make some real progress there. I, I'm speaking to you from Perthshire. I am a Scot and um, I'm very fearful for our United Kingdom. And I, I feel that that's an area that I would like to see the most progress on this year. Thank you very much indeed. And can I thank everyone for joining us today um, for this event? I've certainly learned a lot and I hope everyone's found it very interesting. And thank you again to our panelists. Good morning, everyone.